man goes out drinking with some of his friends, is captured on video walking into the bar, and then disappears. No footage of him coming out of the bar. Hey everyone, it's me, John. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. There are many interesting aspects to the case we are covering today. It is actually one of the most requested cases since I started doing this series that you guys have been asking me to cover. So today we are jumping into the case of Brian Schaefer. Here is a photo of Brian. Uh, I have to say this is a very popular case to be discussed online. Um, there's a lot of people that want to link him to the smiley face murderers. Um, I have a video on that. If you haven't seen it, uh, I'll have links to it down below. But um, personally, I have trouble linking him to that case uh, in particular because there's there's no body that's been found here. And the smiley face killers, that whole theory is based on finding bodies near locations where smiley face graffiti happens. So how people are linking him to that, I really don't understand. The, the main conditions of being part of that theory are not met, at least with this case as it currently stands. But uh, let's head over to NamUs and see what we can learn about this. Uh, Brian Schaefer, he's missing from Franklin County, Ohio. Uh, he was 27 years old when he went missing. Um, his middle name is Randall. The date he was last seen was April 1st, 2006. He was actually going out with his friends uh, at the on March 31st. Uh, and then, of course, it hit past midnight, so it was April 1st when he was last seen. They even have the time noted here at 1.57. Uh, we're going to get to see um, some of the footage a little bit later, and there are basically two instances where he's caught on camera, once when he's first going into the bar, and then another time when he's outside of the bar talking to a few girls. And it looks like he goes back in the bar. For me, that's a little bit of a point of contention that I'm going to discuss with you guys because I'm really not certain if I if I can say that he went back in the bar or not. Uh, his age now would be 38 years old. This is an 11 year old case uh, with a, a brother that has been left behind, a girlfriend that unfortunately had to move on with her life. Um, there's, there's people still wondering what happened to Brian on that night. He is a white male. We have his height at 74 inches, six foot two, and his weight at 160 to 165 pounds. Uh, let's see if we can learn about the circumstances here. Uh, the last images of Brian show him outside the Ugly Tuna Saluna, a bar located near the OSU campus. Uh, outside of that, we have physical description. He has brown hair. Uh, at the time of his disappearance, Brian was a medical student with short professional hair, uh, clean shaven at the time that he went missing. He has hazel eyes. And an interesting note is he has a dot on his left iris. Um, that's that's pretty distinct and, and unique. Uh, outside of that, for tattoos, he has a Pearl Jam tattoo on his right bicep. Um, we can jump over to the Charlie project here. Here's a great composite. Um, I, I love how they always pull together all these photos. So I just want to show you guys uh, these photos of him as well. But at the bottom, here is the tattoo. And apparently this is um, from a single that was released by Pearl Jam. For the clothing and accessories description at NamUs, we have white long sleeve shirt, with light olive green short sleeve polo shirt on top of it and dark blue jeans. For footwear, white Adidas athletic shoes, uh, jewelry, he was actually wearing a yellow cancer awareness rubber bracelet. His mother had unfortunately just died of cancer, a, a very specific type of cancer, three weeks before he disappeared. Um, very tra tragic time going on within this family. And unfortunately, it doesn't stop there, but we'll get to more info on that later. Uh, transportation methods. He was not driving on the night of his disappearance. His car was still at his residence. Uh, he actually lived only about a half a mile away from this bar. Uh, so theoretically, um, you know, he might have been able to walk home. He had been drinking pretty heavy that night. Um, but essentially his friends went back to find him in the bar. They could not find him. They tried to call his cell phone. There was no answer. So they decided to eventually go home without him. 
uh, we can see that they have dental information available. I'm kind of surprised that they don't have any DNA samples collected for him, but I'm sure there's some good reason for that. No fingerprint information. And here we actually have a picture of the actual tattoo that you could see on his arm, as well as some other photos of him. Um, of course, the profile has contact information I'm going to include in the description box below, as well as a case number. Um, I really appreciate when they give us that information, because in some of these cases, we don't have that. Um, I'm going to go through most of the points that the Charlie Project has covered, but there's one thing that they talk about that I wanted to share with you. They mentioned that in May of 2006, now this would be uh, about a month after he disappeared, someone broke into Schaefer's apartment. The burglary turned out to be unrelated to his disappearance. Uh, I was first curious about that when I heard about it because I was thinking if he had disappeared of his own volition, if it, if it was his decision to disappear, maybe he needed to get some things or there were some things that were important to him. So he decided to uh, break into his apartment. I'm not sure why he wouldn't have keys and be able to get in there at that point. But um, from what I've heard, there are... Um, the items that were taken really don't line up with that. It was kind of small electronics items that were taken. Um, things that were worth a lot more money were actually left behind. So this seemed like it was just a straight up burglary. And apparently um, this area is known for being a little rough. Um, there's a lot of crime that goes on in this area, which we're going to hear a little bit more about as we roll forward on this as well. Uh, heading over to Wikipedia, a um, couple points I want to touch on here. Brian Schaefer, uh, he was born February 25th, 1979. He was a medical student at Ohio State University. And on the night of March 31st, 2006, he went out with friends to celebrate the beginning of spring break. Later, he was separated from them and they assumed he had gone home. Um, this wasn't just a typical spring break. He also had plans to go to Miami with his girlfriend. Apparently, um, there was some rumors among his friends that he might be popping the big question to her on that trip. They were supposed to leave the following Monday, um, but unfortunately, it would never happen. He has not been see seen or heard from since. Uh, he is the older of Randy and Renee Schaefer's two sons. In March of 2006, his mother, Renee, died. His friends said that although he appeared to be handling it well, her death was hard for him. He had become romantically involved with a fellow second-year medical student, Alexis Wagoner. She, along with their family and friends, believed that Brian would probably be proposing marriage to her later that year, most likely on a trip to Miami the couple had planned for spring break at the beginning of April. Tropical locations such as Miami were attractive to Brian. He liked the relaxed lifestyle. Uh, he told his friends that despite his decision to pursue a medical career, his real ambition was to start a band playing music in the vein of Jimmy Buffett. And in some other information that I've reviewed, I've seen that he actually did play in a band, I believe when he was in high school. Uh, seems like he was attracted to that kind of scene, appreciated music. As a matter of fact, in some of the info I reviewed about the night that he disappeared, one, one of the theories is that he went to, there was a band that was playing at that bar and that he went to meet those uh, band members after they were done playing. As a matter of fact, uh, authorities actually interviewed them, but they didn't have any information about him. On March 31st, a Friday, classes at OSU ended for spring break. Brian and Randy Schaefer, his father, celebrated the occasion by going out for a steak dinner together earlier that evening. Um, now, the father noted that uh, Randy was pulling all-nighters. He was cramming for his exams before the spring break uh, would kick off and that his father thought that um, Brian was pretty tired and that he wasn't sure that Brian should really be going out with his friend, William Clint Florence, later that night. Um, but ultimately, Brian did wind up doing that, and we know where it went from there. Um, here's an interesting fact just about the Columbus area. Since Columbus has the most security cameras of any city in Ohio, 
Officers next looked to the footage from other bars to see if cameras there could explain how Brian had left the ugly tuna. However, footage from cameras at three other nearby bars showed no trace of Brian. Um, let's get a little more detail on what happened that night. We're going to jump over to the findbrianschafer.com website. Um, this, I believe, is managed by his family. I'm assuming that would be his brother at this point, but uh, let's see here. At around 9.30 p.m., the men headed to the Ugly Tuna Saluna. At 9.56, Brian called his girlfriend and told her that he loved her. Uh, shortly after talking to her, Brian and his friend walked down to the Arena District in Columbus, Ohio. They stopped at the North Short Tavern and then went to Brothers, where they met with other friends. One of the friends drove them back to the Ugly Tuna Saluna, where they are seen on the surveillance tape at 1.15. The next time Brian is seen on cameras, he was outside of the Ugly Tuna at the top of the escalator talking with two girls. He appears to say bye and turns towards the bar. He then disappears from the camera's view and has not been seen since. I really appreciate how they are wording that. Because like I said, I have some questions. A lot of people, when they're discussing this case, they're saying that that footage shows him walk back into the bar. It doesn't. At least the footage that I'm seeing does not show him. It, the angle is wrong for showing if he actually makes it to the front door of the bar or not. Conversations have been had with the two girls who were outside the bar speaking with Brian, but they were not able to provide any additional information to help locate Brian. At one point, the police were looking for an individual seen on the escalator, the man with the orange sweater. This has been ruled out and is not considered linked to Brian's case. Numerous searches have been conducted, including the construction area by the Ugly Tuna Saluna, numerous locations close to his disappearance all to no avail. Um, the interesting thing about this bar is, first of all, it's upstairs. It's, it's a second level bar. So you have to take an escalator to get up to it. And that escalator is the main entry and exit point for that location. There is another way out, which is apparently an emergency exit that leads to, it, it has to hit a stairwell because it comes out on the ground level. Um, I'll, I'll show it to you in a, in a map here pretty soon. But as it's reported, those are the only two ways to get in or out of this place. Then I bumped into some information that said, well, actually, there was a lot of construction going on um, and there might be a freight elevator specifically for the bar. I'm sure that they need to, you know, receive stock in some way. Um, so there is some potential that he could have gone out through this open construction area. Uh, the investigators that were looking into that didn't think it was very feasible because they considered that area pretty rough to get through, particularly for someone uh, in the dark that was intoxicated. And you can see he was bar hopping. According to his friend Clint, they were having shots at every bar that they went to. So he was probably um, pretty well drunk by, by this time of night. So, um, but the thing is, when I'm looking at something like this, um, first of all, it's not a matter of how feasible is it or not. When you've ruled out the other possibilities, you have to look in that direction. Um, and they did. Apparently, they brought dogs to sniff through that area. I've seen conflicting information on if there was hits or not. But regardless, they did not actually find Brian or a, at least a strong enough um, trail of him to lead them to the conclusion that he went out through the open construction area. Heading over to NBCNews.com, we're going to get a little bit of insight from Clint Florence, which is kind of rare in this case, and I'll tell you why after we read through this. Um, this is apparently a transcript of a Dateline episode. The episode's supposed to be available online, but uh, the link that I have, the episode won't play. It just skips to a different news story, so this is the best that I can do here, guys. Um, Clint, that's his friend, told MSNBC's Rita Cosby, um, Brian and I always went out. That's nothing new. Sat down, opened a tab, and then, you know, had three, four, five shots of liquor. Clint told the police that he and Brian walked to some more bars and downed some more shots, and then, with a friend of Clint's in tow, ended the night at the bar where they started. Once inside, they ran into a couple of young women Clint knew. Uh, Brian was doing his usual thing and was talking to those two girls. 
I'm not sure why that's phrased in that way. Um, it's almost phrased as if to lead you to believe that, you know, his girlfriend's out of town and this is his usual thing. He's going to go out and get drunk and talk to girls in a bar. I don't know. It's kind of strange considering that this is a missing persons case. The tone that we're getting from Clint in, in this uh, gives me, it just, it makes me think twice about what's going on in this case. At 1.55 a.m., Brian made his final appearance on the video. He was outside the bar chatting with the young women. Then he walked out of frame and disappeared. Police say it appears he went back into the bar. Minutes later, Clint and his friend got ready to go. It was closing time, 2.10, 2 o'clock, and Brian was nowhere to be seen. They told police they called Brian's cell and got no answer, even checked the bathroom, but no luck. So they left without him. Now, what I'm wondering about is um, closing time, right? They're, they're announcing that within the bar. The bar is clearing out. People are closing up their tabs, heading for the front door. It's probably not the busiest time for that bar. It's probably not one of the times where it is the most packed. And if, if what Clint is saying is accurate, he went in actually looking for Brian. So what's the likelihood that he wouldn't be able to find him in a bar that's emptying out at that time of night? I think it's probably pretty low. Admittedly, I haven't been to that bar. I know some bars are much bigger than others and they have all kinds of, um, you know, dividing walls and things of that nature. But when you have a, a group of friends looking for someone and they don't find them in there, um, I don't know. I, I really struggle with the thought that Brian was actually back in the bar. And I'll tell you, I also struggle with it because why did he leave the bar in the first place. He's outside of the bar, uh, literally 10 to 15 minutes based on what Clint is saying here, 10 to 15 minutes before Clint goes looking for him. Was there a reason why he would go outside the bar and then decide to go back in literally right before? I mean, he only has a few minutes before this bar closes. What's his motivation to go back in? Maybe to go find his friends? I mean, you've got such a small gap of time for whatever happened to him to happen. Uh, and you have people that are coming out of the bar around that time because it's closing, plenty of witnesses. I just really struggle with the thought that something happened to him in that bar. I think there's some aspect of this story that we don't understand. I think it's related to the fact that he was outside of the bar at about 155, and I don't think he went back in. I think he might have gone somewhere else. So let's take a look at the available footage and let's let that speak for itself. Uh, this is from a top fives video. I'll have a link to it down below so you can review it as you want as well. Um, starting with the image of Brian here. And here he is coming up the escalator. He's got his friends behind him. Here he is the last time he was seen out there speaking to the girls and then he walks back. Now this take goes a little longer. We see him, he's speaking to the girls and then he heads back. Now, what's interesting is the door for this bar is pretty much where the escalator is leading right up into. You've got two security guys here and what looks to me like some type of kind of mezzanine area. And what I'm wondering is, um, is this like more like a mall? Is there a bunch of other businesses that are up here? And is he admittedly walking out of the camera's view, but maybe not going to those doors. Maybe he's coming up against the wall and then heading off to the right. Um, what is the function of these security guards right here? I wonder if they're placed there because the rest of the mall might be closed at this time of night and they're trying to stop people from going over off in that direction. Um, I don't think that these are bar staff. These are typically not the type of staff that I would see as bouncers for a bar. So this whole scene, um, the way that I'm looking at it, has not been explained very well. Uh, I, I haven't seen any real solid explanation of that. Here's the location from the outside. So we can see the ugly tuna saloon sign right here. This second level is where it is. Below it is a uh, restaurant, looks like it's called Mad Mex. And to get into this place, um, which also has a balcony over here worth noting, and some people have theorized, um, could he have jumped over the balcony in some way? If you look over here, um, 
you know, potentially he could have dropped from the balcony down to this ledge and then dropped down. I don't know why. I don't know why he would choose to do that, but it does seem somewhat feasible that there was another escape route from this area, which was that balcony. Um, but if we come over here, you will see this is the stairway. We can see the ugly tuna sign is here. And uh, it's kind of hard to make out because of the reflection, but I believe that the escalators that we're seeing are in here. Now, what I'm also noticing is uh, we have other businesses with their signs on this door also. We have Torpedo Room. Um, there is an office for Ohio State University, the Office of University Compliance and Integrity. There is the Gateway Film Center. Um, there's another bar, it looks like it might be called 312, that's also available through this door. So I, I question if you walk in through this, I wish if there's a brain scratcher out there that lives close to this area, please let me know. Do you walk through this door and see those escalators? And is there more businesses off to the left that you can get to from being in there? Um, this door over here is supposedly the emergency exit door that uh, he might have also come out of, but people say that there's a camera set up to capture anyone coming out of this door with a trigger on it to automatically zoom in this area if he comes out of this door. And they checked that footage and there was no footage of him leaving through that way either. Um, yeah, this, this whole, the way this building is designed to me, looks like this is all connected almost just like a mall, like an indoor mall would be. And I do have some experience working when I was really young, I worked uh, some construction projects in malls. And then of course, when I worked at the Dolby Theater, um, which is wrapped around an outdoor mall, um, I had access to areas that, that the general public didn't. And there was basically whole um, hallway systems back there that no one else knew about. And there were hallways primarily for like construction workers and people bringing deliveries to the businesses to use. I'm wondering if this building has something like that. Like there's some additional hallway structures that haven't been discussed publicly for some reason in this case. Uh, or once again, is it just as simple as, yeah, this is an open uh, mezzanine area and there are businesses that extend off to the right that we can see here. It just, it, it would really make sense to me with these two guys standing here that that would be the case. What is their function? Jumping back over to the Wikipedia article, his girlfriend, Alexis Wagoner, called Brian's phone every evening before going to bed for a long time after the disappearance. Usually it went to voicemail, but one night in September, it actually rang three times. I kept calling it to hear it purely because it was one of the best sounds I had ever heard, even if no one picked up, she wrote on her MySpace page. Singular, Brian's wireless provider, said it might have been a glitch that caused a different phone to ring. His phone was not GPNS enabled, so its location could not be determined. A ping from the phone was detected at a cell tower in Hillard, 14 miles northwest of Columbus. Kind of interesting to me. Um, you know, I haven't heard an excuse about cell phones like that. I mean, almost like a crossed wire, which we I did experience um, way back when phones were wired, <laughs> like in the 80s, you would occasionally pick up the phone to make a phone call. And sometimes you might hear another conversation going on or something weird like that. I really haven't had that type of experience with cell phones. Uh, admittedly, this is back in 2006. But I don't know, this this is kind of strange to me. If it really was a hit from his phone, um, you're talking that for some reason he would have left his life, but he would have only been 14 miles away. It just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me or the possibility that someone else had his phone, uh, kicked it on for some reason. And then she happened to call when it was turned on. In September of 2008, during a heavy windstorm in central Ohio, Randy Schaefer was out in the yard of his Baltimore home clearing debris. A branch blew off from a nearby tree and fatally struck him. After his obituary ran online, a condolence book was posted. One of the signatures in it said, To Dad, Love Brian, from the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
Upon further investigation, the note was found to have been posted from a computer accessible to the public in Franklin County. It was determined to be a hoax. Um, I'm wondering if it is a hoax or is it someone trying to comment in some way on uh, possibly what Brian did here. Uh, essentially, Clint has decided to not cooperate with the investigation. He was initially cooperating and then he stopped. Uh, he lawyered up, as they say, and he also denied a um, polygraph test. So could it be that Clint, a friend of his, someone else that knows that Brian might have actually run away from his situation? Maybe he was feeling pressured by what was going on at school. Maybe he felt like it wasn't the right path for him. His mother had just died. Maybe he was not going to um, propose to his girlfriend, or maybe that was adding pressure and he just wanted to disappear from everything. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of possibilities in this case, but I have to say, if he really did disappear, um, his cell phone wasn't used, his bank account wasn't used, all his stuff was still at home, glasses that he needs were still at home. Um, I, it's just, I, I don't know that I can believe that he just upped and disappeared. Uh, unless potentially it was something he had planned for a while, stored up a bunch of money, had one of his friends hold on to it, knew that this was going to be his last big blowout with his friend. Uh, and maybe that's why Clint has been a little hard to deal with in terms of the investigation. I don't know, guys. Um, so 10 years after it happened, uh, just back in April of 2016, there was a new round of press that kind of kicked up on it. Uh, let's get some insight on what has happened since he disappeared. 10 years ago today, Brian Schaefer vanished. Derek, that is his brother, uh, still wears a green missing person bracelet with his brother's name. Derek lost his entire immediate family in short order. Cancer took his mom. Three weeks later, his brother disappeared. And about two years after that, his father, who searched hardest for Brian, was killed by a falling tree branch in a windstorm. There were hundreds of interviews, thousands of hours watching video, and countless dead ends. Did someone murder the handsome 27 year old Ohio State University medical student? One theory that has been kicked around is if he did manage to get out of the building somehow and decided to try to walk home uh, in this kind of tough area, was he potentially robbed? Did it go wrong? Did someone wind up killing him and then dumping his body somewhere? Um, unfortunately, I think that's a theory that it's very hard to rule out. And the likelihood of that, I think, is higher to me than he's still in the bar somewhere, which some people are actually questioning. Some people think that he ran into some issue in the bar and someone has hidden his body in the bar. Um, I can't say that I think that that is really feasible. I think it's more feasible that he got out, got on his way home. He was drunk. Someone might have taken advantage of that situation and harmed him. Did the death of his mother and stress of medical school cause him to run away from his life? We're going to see there's a little more information that comes from his girlfriend later in this article that might actually support that. Or did he kill himself? Um, one thing that we haven't really looked at here, let's go back to the map and just pull it out, um, is how close he is to water sources. And especially if you're buying into the theory that he's part of... Um, the smiley face murder thing, uh, you have to figure that someone got him to a water source. So if we zoom out here, we can see a direct line from where the bar is to the nearest water source is about a mile. And outside of that, uh, we actually have his home address. Let me run a search on that for you guys. And we can see that here's the bar and approximately, I think it's been, I think people have said it's about six blocks away, um, but within easily within half a mile, it even notes it as half a mile here, uh, is his home. So for some reason, he would have had to have been so upset that he decided to not go home, uh, continue on. Looks like there's a bridge at King Avenue could have potentially jumped off that bridge uh, or someone could have taken him to that bridge and done something with him. But um, I don't know. I don't know. It is such a short walk. And 
for as tight as that time frame is that I was talking about between when, when he's last seen on the video and his friends are looking for him, this time frame is also pretty tight. You're talking a 10 minute walk from that bar to his home and he would have been home safe and sound. Did something happen to him on that path? I think we really, really have to consider that. Ryan Schaefer wanted his family to celebrate the beginning of vacation with him and friends. He actually invited his brother, Derek, and Derek's current wife, uh, who was his girlfriend back then, uh, Morin, to meet him at the Ugly Tuna Saluna after their date at the Funny Bone Comedy Club. But the show ran late and the high school sweethearts decided they were too tired to visit a crowded campus bar on High Street. So they drove straight home. Once again, note. This place is known as being a crowded campus bar. There should have been plenty of witnesses if something happened to him inside of that bar. Quote, I've thought about that night over and over for 10 years, said Derek, now 34. What if I had been there that night? Would things have been different? Would my brother still be here? I've carried that guilt around for a while. Um, Clint Florence initially cooperated with the investigation, but then hired an attorney and refused to take a polygraph test or talk further with police. Here's a quote from Derek. If I saw him, I'd say, where the hell is my brother? If anyone knows whether he is still alive or if something happened to him, it's Clint. Um, possibly, but I have to say, I think in most cases, if you do contact an attorney because there's some investigation going on, the attorney is going to tell you not to cooperate. I've kind of bumped into that time and time again, looking into these cases. It doesn't always mean that you really have something that you could be held criminally, criminally liable for. Um, sometimes that is just what they consider the best mode of operation, just the best way to get through an investigation like that. And we have seen certain cases where people talk to the police, all of a sudden they become a person of interest. Has anyone wound up in jail that um, doesn't deserve to be there because they were trying to cooperate with police? I've seen a few cases here or there where you might think that that was actually the conclusion. So uh, I'm, I'm not positive that Clint is actually uh, all knowing in terms of where Brian is, especially if there's that other possibility that Brian got out of the building somehow and someone else did something to him. Uh, his girlfriend, Alexis, doesn't believe in one particular theory. Looking back, she finds it odd that a few days before that night in the bar, Brian told her to move on and find someone else because he was struggling with his mom's death. And that a couple of weeks before that, he asked her to quote, just go away with him. So it seems like if you add those considerations, the possibility that he left of his own volition is, it's debatable. Um, it's just, it really troubles me whenever I look into these cases and that theory comes up and you hear that the person has no means of supporting themselves or, or living. I mean, if, if you're not, unless he had withdrawn a bunch of cash w out of one of his accounts, which did not come out in any, any of the information I reviewed here, the feasibility of that just seems extremely low. So it's really tough. Uh, there is a Facebook group, Find Brian Schaefer. I will have a link to that down below so you can check it out as well. It looks like there's going to be a new podcast dedicated specifically to this case. There are several podcasts that are already out there. I'll have a link to one that I listened to in the description box down below as well. I did look into Ugly Tuna Saluna just to see what Yelpers were thinking about it. And it seems like people have a real love-hate relationship with this place. Um, a lot of people think it's okay, but some people hate it. They just talk about it's smelly, it's horrible, uh, service is terrible, drinks aren't that great, you can't get your bill, your, your tab paid off to get out. Um, but several people do note that it smells bad. Some people say it smells like urine. Some people say it smells like vomit. <sighs> Once we're considering that theory, if if he was hidden in there somewhere, um, I've seen people talk about that theory and they always note, wouldn't you notice the smell? People are saying that this place stinks, but I think that's a bit different than saying, you know what, it smells like death in there. And from what I understand, it is a very distinct smell that people don't really forget. So this is where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. 
where is Brian? What has happened to this young man? Do you subscribe to the theory that um, he's part of the smiley for the smiley face murder phenomenon? Um, personally, like I said, it doesn't meet the criteria for me. I know people like to talk about that and they lump him in with it for some reason. I don't think that's really fair. I think this case needs to look needs to be looked at individually. Um, we have footage that once again, does not give us a strong determination that he actually makes it into the bar, particularly that last time where he's out talking to the girls. I wonder about his motivation for being out there at that time. Were the girls leaving and he was seeing them out? Unfortunately, there's not enough footage for me to really get a good sense of what's going on in that scene at that point. Um, speaking of which, if any of you bump into better footage, uh, maybe longer footage of that, please share it with the rest of us in the comment box below. We really need some people digging in on that footage a little bit, I think. Um, they have considered that perhaps he changed his clothing for some reason and then uh, evaded the cameras on the way out, like if he was wearing a hat and kind of you know ducked the camera as he was going out. I don't know why he would do that. Changing clothing, I did have one potential thought if he got sick, you know, um, if he maybe got sick on himself and then took off that olive top, now you're talking about him just being in a white long sleeve. But I have to think that investigators would have caught that when they were reviewing all the camera footage. And apparently they did an analysis where they watched everyone that was going into the bar and then tried to account for everyone coming out. And he is the only person that they couldn't account for. If they really did that analysis right, which I'm not positive, but if they literally did it one to one, like, hey, here's this guy, we've identified him by his hat, his orange sweater, and his shorts, and then matched up with, okay, we can tell that he leaves at this specific time on to the next person. If they really did a one to one comparison and Brian slipped out because of some costume change of some kind, they would have had an extra person leaving that didn't enter the place. And from what I've heard, they didn't have anything come out of an analysis like that. So I don't know. Um, part of this story seems like it's kind of growing into folklore. There are people that just insist that, hey, the footage shows him go back into the bar. Like I told you guys, I do not agree with that. If it doesn't show it, we can't make that firm conclusion. We can say he headed in the direction of where the doors were, but there's also a wall there that continues on. And I believe there's access to other businesses that might be up there. Um, I'm still, unfortunately, I don't live close enough or I would have literally driven down there and checked it out for myself. But if any of you brain scratchers are close enough, please go there and check it out for me. Let us know in the comments below. Does that top area continue? Are there other businesses up there? Are there other ways to get around in and out up there? Uh, and if it is a local bar to him, if there is some type of you know, back door hallway structure like some malls have, uh, would he be aware of that? Would it make it quicker for him to get home if he knew that there was a back exit that dropped him on a street that, you know, shaved off one of the blocks on his six block walk? Um, just another thing to consider, but I feel terrible for his brother. And I really hope that the answers come someday to him so he can know what happened to Brian and move forward from that. I just, so much tragedy that guy has faced in such a short time. It's really, really terrible. Uh, his girlfriend did move on. She has become married and does have children. She's working as an OBGYN. So um, it's just kind of how life goes sometimes when people go missing, but tragic case. Thank you guys so much for spending some time with me here on Brain Scratch. Uh, please feel free to share this with friends of yours in the Ohio area. Let's try to keep exposure raised to this case. It's kind of tough when you have a story that was this big. And then, you know, last year they kind of had the 10 year anniversary and then all of a sudden things start falling off the radar again. Um, I'm hopeful that this video can help keep some eyes, ears and thoughts on Brian Schaefer and what happened to him and where is he? Take care, everyone, and I'll see you back here tomorrow on the Lord and Arts Channel.